Welcome to today's Global Connections program. I'm Bill Miller. How does the United Nations communicate with the media, the public, and policymakers about topics such as war and peace, economic and social development, and human rights? We'll be back in just a moment to talk about these and other important issues. Welcome back to our program. Today we're taking a look at the United Nations and how it communicates about the myriad of topics it deals with every day. My guest is an expert in this area. My guest today is Mr. Mar Nasser. Mr. Mar Nasser has over 26 years of work experience in the United Nations system, during which he has worked in various capacities in Gaza, Jerusalem, Vienna, Amman, New York, and Cairo. Prior to assuming his current post as Director of the Outreach Division in the Department of Public Information in New York, Mr. Nasser was the Director of the United Nations Information Service in Vienna. Previously, he worked as Chief of the New York Liaison Office for the UN Relief and Works Agency for Palestine Refugees in the Near East, commonly called UNRWA. Mar Nasser, welcome to today's Global Connections program. Thank you. I appreciate you being with me today. Let's jump right into the Department of Public Information. Uh, basically, what does that do? And then we'll talk about your office in a little greater detail. Okay. Uh, DPI, Department of Public Information, basically tries to tell the world what the UN does, what it decides on, and the activities that are on the agenda and issues on the agenda of the United Nations. It, it's basically aimed at telling the story of the United Nations, how it does it, so that there's a better understanding of what is this organization that member states are part of and that they contribute to it uh, regularly, uh, what it decides on, what are the issues on its agenda, and how maybe they themselves can have a role in supporting that agenda. Mm -hmm. And now your office of the Outreach Division, exactly what does it do and wh who are some of the groups you're networking with? The Outreach Division more or less is within the department. We have three divisions. Outreach is the one that looks for solidifying and building on partnerships with the civil society, non-governmental organizations, academic community, creative community, film, television uh, community, uh, as well as, of course, uh, a series of deposited libraries around the, around the world. The Dag Hammarskjöld Library is part of the outreach division. We also host about a quarter of a million visitors to the United Nations, guided tours, uh, including a special one for children, uh, exhibit space, uh, and a myriad of publications that educate about what the UN does. Mm -hmm. You mentioned children, and it's so important that children learn about so many facets mm -hmm. of, of our lives. Many years ago, they taught the United Nations in the high schools and colleges, but they don't do as much of that anymore. What types of programs do you have to reach out to children to help inform them about the issues the UN is dealing with and how these issues impact their lives? Several years ago, the UN uh, created a website called Cyber School Bus, which needs update. But it has information that is used by teachers. It's a resource for those who want to teach about the United Nations. Some schools do have curricula that indicates about the UN. What we try to do around the UN Day is ourselves here in New York organize visits to public schools in New York and around it, what we call the UN For You, where we ask senior officials and colleagues to go out and speak about their own work to uh, sometimes one or two classrooms, sometimes an entire school. Uh, we do the same with our colleagues in the field, encourage them to go out and talk about that. We also tried to create publications that can be used to educate what the UN is doing. We've recently introduced a children's tour, as I mentioned, only about a year and a half ago. And that has been very, very successful, so that it's targeting the information that would reach the level of children so that they have a better understanding of what the UN is about. Mm -hmm. Do you find that the children are very interested in the United Nations and the topics you, that you're dealing with? They are indeed. And of course, one of the special schools in the area is the United Nations International School, which is in New York and two-thirds of the student population 
are coming from UN families, staff and diplomats. And, and we have a sort of a close relationship. Last weekend, last week, Friday and Thursday, uh, students from the high school were here, spent the whole two days at the United Nations. Mm -hmm. You mentioned about celebrities and the entertainment industry. And of course, we see that a lot of really uh, very high profile stars, such as George Clooney is a messenger of peace for the Secretary General. Angelina Jolie is, uh, is an ambassador, I think, for the High Commission for Refugees, mm -hmm. I believe. And how do you involve these folks? How do you bring them in and tap into their, really their desire to help make a better world, but also drawing upon their status or high visibility that they get with the media? Mm -hmm. I mean, historically, the United Nations uh, used and you most probably uh, by UNICEF was the first to, to recruit and, and engage celebrities. They demand the media's attention and by doing so, if they spotlight on a certain cause or a request for funding, then there's usually more interest in that from the media uh, and a wider scope of the media than, than just those interest in political issues. So historically speaking, the UN appointed goodwill ambassadors and messengers of peace uh, identifying an, a key area where they have interests, that our interests are aligned, and they have also shown dedication towards that issue in particular. Uh, most recent appointment as messenger of peace was Lang Lang, the famed uh, pianist, who for 10 years served as goodwill ambassador for UNICEF, and last October the Secretary General appointed him as messenger of peace uh, mm -hmm. for the United Nations, and his focus is education. So we are working with him to promote the Secretary General's Global Education First Initiative, which is one of the highlights of the focus uh, in 2012 on education. Mm -hmm. Now, you have others too, I think. Dr. Jane Goodall focuses on the environment. Uh, Michael Douglas on disarmament. disarmament. Uh, George Clooney on Darfur and that area of the world. But these, these are folks who really put themselves in harm's way in many cases. They go out to some very dangerous areas of the world. Angelina Jolie has gone to the refugee camps. Mm -hmm. that, mm -hmm. that really is very commendable on their part, that they want to be that involved. Many of them definitely um, are driven very strongly in the causes that they are working with. And of course, as I mentioned, Lang Lang changed from being good ambassador to messenger of peace. Sometimes the relationship has to come to an end where either for they seek to, to do something else or pursue a, a different interest. So uh, you'll, you'll see changes uh, in the lists uh, regularly, on a regular basis. Um, it is a very important contribution that they make, and many of them are interested in supporting the issues that Dion is working on. Mm -hmm. Now, if our viewers would like, and I'm sure many will, would like to go to your website. It's a long one, but mm -hmm. it's one worthwhile. It's www.un.org backslash en backslash hq backslash dpi. Or <coughs> they could probably just Google UN Department of Public Information and we'll get there. So mm -hmm. it, it's a very interesting website and you have a lot of good information on it. The, there's another program that you're involved in, the Creative Community Outreach Initiative. What exactly is that? CCOI mm -hmm. for short. What exactly is that program about? It's a three, four year old <coughs> program where in addition to the celebrities, which is di a different focus, uh, which is using their celebrity status, this is working with filmmakers or television producers in incorporating issues on the UN's agenda in the television programs or films that they are producing so that it can reach a wider audience in a softer way. Uh, similarly, sometimes a film that we see has relevance to an issue that we are working on, then we might organize a screening at the UN followed by a discussion with the director or producers and linking that with the issue that we are talking about. Just to give you an example, less than two weeks ago, Steve McQueen was hosted at a screening of his film, 12 Years a Slave, here at the United Nations. It was Wednesday, and then on Sunday, he won the Oscar for the best movie. And that was part of our observance of the transatlantic slave trade uh, commemoration for the victims of the slavery and transatlantic slave trade, which is one of the agendas on uh, our calendar. Now, these events that take place, I remember, was that about two years ago you did the, the special event at the UN on the, the transatlantic slave trade? I remember you had some very prominent personalities here. Uh, will all of these be on the website? Can mm -hmm. people go to them and download them or take a look at them, view them through video, live streaming, or not live, but streaming video? 
The International Day for the Commemoration of the Victims of Slavery and the Transatlantic Slave Trade is on the 25th of March. So this is the time of the year, every year for the last four or five years, that we organize a series of activities that include uh, an exhibit at the UN, that include a cultural event. And in the past years, uh, we had concerts in the General Assembly. But this year, because the General Assembly is on the renovation, there will be not be a concert. And the exhibit will be taking place in the summer. We're actually trying to to spread those activities throughout the, the year. There's usually a website specifically for this observance that is online. And in addition, we also use social media to promote what we are doing in relation to the activities that we're doing. So mm -hmm. we, have, we would establish a Twitter hashtag, especially for the, those events, or a Facebook page, and so on. Exactly. Now, what uh, do you have? I'm sure you have a lot of events that are coming up very soon. You, one, one event that comes up every year is International Day of Peace. It's mm -hmm. been fixed at September 21st, as Correct. I recall. Mm -hmm. uh, do you have special activities that take place on that particular day? I know there are many other important days, like World Health Day, International AIDS Day, the International Day of Women, uh, just on across mm -hmm. the board. There are many uh, to, fo to focus the spotlight, obviously, by the General Assembly on these folks are on these issues, but uh, what do you do on the International Day of Peace? Is there something in particular that's special that you do? On, on that day, usually we organize an event here centrally at the UN headquarters. We invite our messengers of peace, all of them. Uh, not all of them are able to participate or, or come to New York uh, on that day. And it's usually done actually before that day, because if that day is too close to the opening of the general debate, then mm -hmm. for security reasons, we cannot have it during that week, so we have it the week before. Uh, the event usually involves uh, a traditional ceremony at the Peace Bell, which was a contribution from J Japan to the United Nations, um, a ringing of the Peace Bell by the Secretary General, by the President of the General Assembly, by the Ambassador of Japan, and those presents from the uh, Messengers of Peace, followed by a student conference where we engage students from nearby schools. Uh, also, often we try to have a video link with students in countries where we have a peacekeeping mission, where it's Haiti or somewhere else, or another school uh, that is interested in the International Day of Peace, involving activities relating to what those children themselves are doing to promote the International Day of Peace and the concept mm -hmm. of peace as a way to resolve conflict. When well, you're watching Global <coughs> Connections Television, which is an independently produced program, the opinions expressed on Global Connections are solely those of the moderator and his guest. Today we're taking a look at the United Nations Department <coughs> of Public Information and how it disseminates information to the media, the public, and policymakers about really a myriad of issues that the UN deals with every day, dealing with war and peace, dealing with economic and social development, and with human rights. My guest today is someone who's very knowledgeable of this area. My guest today is Mr. Maren Nasser. Mr. Maren Nasser is the Director of the Outreach Division in the Department of Public Information at the United Nations in New York. Maren, we're talking about youth, and uh, uh, youth are so critical, obviously. Mm -hmm. they're, they're important today, and they'll be even more important tomorrow when they're the leaders of the world and our future leaders. And people who are implementing policies who are hopefully going to create this better world. Let's talk a little bit about one thing Secretary General Ban Ki-moon has done. He created a special position, <coughs> an envoy on youth. Mm -hmm. uh, what exactly is this position and why did he create it? At the beginning of his second term, the Secretary General identified working with and for young people and women as one of his top priorities. And to basically enable a direct follow-up to that uh, priority, he appointed uh, an envoy on youth, which, who started working in February of last year. And the envoy on youth works out of the outreach division in the Department of Public Information. A 29-year-old Jordanian young man who is very attuned to ish policy issues, young youth issues, has been working for many, many years on those in the region, but also at an international level. He plays the role of um, galvanizer of what the UN is doing itself on youth issues and coordinating with the different focal points within the UN system on youth issues. And also, as a young person, maybe can reach younger people in a better way than older bureaucrats <laughs> do. <laughs> right. uh, so he's working to harmonize, to streamline, to work with the existing focal points, to uh, push towards the more sensitivity to youth issues in the current discussions on the post-2015 development agenda. 
and has been traveling quite a bit to visit different regions of the world to you listen to young people <coughs> and to collect their views on how youth should be represented in the future. And he has recently launched a platform online to collect uh, inputs mm -hmm. from youth organizations around the world on how they think the youth issue should be an addressed youth priorities in the post-2015 development agenda. Mm -hmm. And as we mentioned before, it's very important to bring youth into the, to the equation today, into the discussion, and certainly into the future. Another program that's been around for many years now is the Model United Nations program. I think it started back, really back in 1919, about the time the League of Nations was developed, mm -hmm. but it uh, has been moving along. Uh, uh, tell us a little bit, what is the Model United Nations program briefly, and then how are you involved in that Model UN program? Model UN Simulations, um, it's a program which was created and, and it grew up independently of the United Nations, of students, at first at university level, but now it's very popular at the high school level, mm -hmm. simulating the United Nations, how it functions, where students are uh, uh, assigned different countries that they come and represent. They have to do research to know exactly how that country would vote on a particular issue and then conduct a simulation of a General Assembly or a Security Council or another organ of the United Nations. The what I've seen is that at least from empirical evidence or what people are talking about who are enthusiastic about modern United Nations, at least 400 to 500,000 young people participate in a Model UN around the world. So DPI took notice of this and recognized it as a very important way to learn about how the UN functions and what are the issues on the agenda of the United Nations. And it's also a very fun way for young people to learn on issues on the agenda of the UN and how the UN functions. So we organized three Model UNs ourselves in Geneva, in Kuala Lumpur, and Incheon. The last one was 2011. But subsequently, rather than organize one Model UN out of the thousands that are being organized, we took the approach that let's develop our own workshop to train the trainers on how people can actually do a proper simulation. Because to tell you the truth, most of those simulations that are taking place around the world actually are not simulating the UN because they're not using the correct rules of procedure, they are not using the correct terminology, they're also focused more about the debate, more mm -hmm. about the winning team, rather than about a win-win situation, finding the common ground, finding the, uh, the way most resolutions are adopted now in the UN mm -hmm. since the 1990s, 80% actually and more, mm -hmm. are adopted by consensus. It's not about winning the, the vote count, it's about how can you actually negotiate to reach consensus. So that's also another area that where we differ. So we have developed a manual for how to properly simulate the UN, which we are now promoting through these workshops that we conduct. We've conducted uh, three already, two in New York, one in Vienna for the General Assembly, and one in Baku in Azerbaijan for the Security Council simulation. Mm -hmm. And this manual, can people access it on your website, or can they just Google United Nations Model United Nations Manual Correct. by Department of Public Information, and it will come up? If they goes also go to the Outreach Division in the website on mm -hmm. DPI, then from there it will be also uh, found there. Mm -hmm. That would be a very helpful tool mm -hmm. for people who want to put on Model UN programs, or even if somebody just wanted to learn a little more about Model UN, because it's a wonderful concept, and as you mentioned, about a half million students at, at the probably at least. At the very least. Mm -hmm. That's right. That's probably a lowball figure of people participating, but it's a wonderful program. I've talked to hundreds of people over the years, and every I've never heard one person complain about it, no matter which state or which country they came from, but they've enjoyed it very much. You have another program, if we could bump up mm -hmm. a little, uh, uh, up to uh, another age level, shall we say, to the universities, United Nations Academic Impact. What is UNAI, what is that program, and what do you accomplish with it? UN Academic Impact was launched by the Secretary General Ban Ki-moon in November of 2010. It's now uh, about three years old. Uh, it aims to create an, a sort of a partnership between the United Nations and institutions of higher learning, uh, academic research, so that they can work with us or and with themselves to promote the issues on the UN's agenda to create a better future, basically. 
There are now over 1,000 universities in 100, over 120 countries who have joined the academic impact. The 10 basic principles are derived from the Charter of the United Nations, commitment to sustainability, commitment to issues that on the MDG, Millennium Development Goals, uh, Universal Declaration of Human Rights. And by working with those institutions and by them working between with each other, mm -hmm. we hope that the responsibility of what they call intellectual social responsibility uh, becomes in, ingrained in, in those institutions and they contribute in a way to solving issues on the UN's agenda. Without research, without academic contributions, most of what we enjoy today in, in, in terms of improvements in health, in science, in technologies would not be where it is. Now, if someone were at a university, a university president or whatever in Mexico City or in Buenos Aires or mm -hmm. in Ottawa, Canada or wherever, wanted to become involved in this, do they go online to sign up or do they contact your office or how would they go about doing that to get in touch with the proper person who could explain to them what the program is about? Membership is free. It's free. That's the first okay. Well, that's, that's, the first that's a good start. That's the first part. <laughs> and we do require a letter from the president or rector of the university directly to us, which is available online. Mm -hmm. They need to complete a form. Again, it's available online. That gives us a bit of information about the institution. And they have to make a commitment to undertake one activity or two or three from the list of commit from the principles uh, during one or two years. Holding a model United Nations could be one of them. Organizing a workshop mm -hmm. on an issue on the agenda of the United Nations is another. Uh, and, and so on and so forth. So it's, it's a very wide range of issues that I'm sure every university can actually manage to, to mm -hmm. some extent to do. The more they do, the better, of course. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Have any of the universities expressed an interest in starting a course on the United Nations, specifically talking about the UN, for example, in the Department of Public Administration, which is a logical place. Usually when you have courses on the United Nations, it's in the International Relations mm -hmm. Department, mm -hmm. international organizations, global governance, different places like that. But a logical place, too, is in the Department of Public Administration because everybody who works at the United Nations is an international civil servant also known as an international public administrator, but have they talked about trying to start a specific course on the UN? I think there are a number of universities that I know that have a pro have programs that mm -hmm. focus on the United Nations and outside of international studies right, programs exactly. as well. Yes, uh, you have uh, public policy institutions mm -hmm. might have a, a certain program related to the United Nations. So uh, I don't have we don't have a complete list of those, but I'm, I'm mm -hmm. sure that it's probably an endless list and it's, it's a continuing and growing list. We, we frequently receive requests for uh, more information, more material that can be used by those universities uh, to teach about the United Nations. Mm -hmm. And again, if our viewers would like to go to your website, they can certainly do that and mm -hmm. go to uh, Department of Public Information and get more information about what we're talking about today and some of the things we probably will not have a chance to talk about. Well, Mara, you've got a tremendous network, a lot of outreach programs going on. Who are some of your other partners? So who do you, I, you've got so many, are there like 1,500 uh, non-governmental organizations that are accredited with the Department of Public Information? It's a huge number, mm -hmm. I can't remember exactly, but, but uh, who are some of the partners, not to try to identify them all or pick one over the other, that, that you work with on these programs? As as you rightly said, there are about 1,500 of those. So to mention even <laughs> any number would be unfair to the, true, to the rest of them. Very true. But we do work very closely with the uh, executive committee, what we call the DPI NGO mm -hmm. executive committee, which is a group of uh, volunteers from their organizations who work with us throughout the year, mainly in coordinating our joint activities, but also the ultimate uh, or the, the top end of it is the annu an annual conference. And uh, this year we have now reached uh, an agreement. Basically, there will be a conference on 27 to 29 August mm -hmm. here at the UN in, in New York after uh, two years of uh, missing on a having a conference. And the last mm -hmm. one was in Bonn in 2011. The conference will be looking at 2015 and beyond our action agenda. So it's a contribution of the civil society on the discussions on the post-2015 development agenda. They will also be looking at issues related to climate change and where we are with the MDGs. So these are topics, and this conference is mm -hmm. organized and led by the NGOs. Our mm -hmm. role is to facilitate and to, to make the linkages within the UN system for mm -hmm. them to be able to have a, a real partnership 
uh, in terms of success, success in the uh, organization and outcome of the document. Mm -hmm. And the outcome document in 2011, for example, from the Bonn conference, was, uh, went directly to Rio plus 20. At the time, it was seen as the, the main input or contribution from the civil society into the discussions uh, into what went into uh, Rio plus 20 uh, conference. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, in the last 30 seconds or so that we have left, what do you see as a major challenge for the Department of Public Information at the United Nations in getting the message out to the public, to the media, to the policymakers, and just everybody who would have an interest in the issues you're dealing with? I think the challenge that we're, we're now facing more than uh, any other is that there are more issues on the agenda of the UN. There are more issues that we would like to be involved in. Mm -hmm. At the same time, uh, the UN, like any other institution of public uh, finance is facing uh, reductions in, in, in budgets. And, and I think that's a complete uh, direct result from the 2008 financial crisis that is affecting, has affected governments, will affect those being funded by governments. So the challenge is how to do more with ever dwindling resources. And the more is growing, not because it is uh, self-perpetuating, uh, but because the problems on the international agenda are growing. Mm, exactly. And you're working with a wide range of groups uh, all across the board, uh, but it's very important we learn more about the United Nations. But Mara Nasser, Director of the Outreach Division at the Department of Public Information, I'd like to thank you so very much for a very you're interesting welcome. and a very informative program. Thank you, Bill. Thank you. I'm Bill Miller. Thank you for joining us on today's Global Connections program.